just to repeat uh, what Basil said, I'd like to thank uh, um, Bruce Fetzer and his uh, team for uh, running this conference, magnificent conference, and also for um, having the wisdom, <laughs> I say jokingly, to, to, to help me as well. Anyway, so I'm actually just going to do um, an ex talk about our experiment. I'm not going to do any sort of theory or mathematics behind this. Um, and I'm just going to try and show you where, where we are. Um, Vincenzo um, is the guy who really did all this work. He should be giving this talk, really, to be honest, because uh, it's really his work. He's a student working with me on this, and, uh, and uh, he's, done a, he's done a sterling job. And so what we're going to talk about is actually how we do the weak measurement of spin, and we're actually going to do it with um, um, uh, an atomic system. Uh, so the plan of the talk is I'm just going to... I just want to just say a couple of words about the weak measurement um, in, in general. Then I'm just going to talk about the method we're following and how we're actually trying to put it together. And I'm just going to finish off by explaining the progress that we've made. And, uh, and as I said, I'm going to focus on the experiment. I'm not really going to focus on anything theoretical at all, except uh, just the one of the op on my opening slide... When I first started reading this, I seemed to, it seemed to be this confusion going on around about, uh, about what, is a, what is a strong measurement, what is a weak measurement. And so from my perspective, and hopefully this is correct, is that for me, strong measurement is basically von Neumann. And that is, is that when we are, unamb we are unambiguously measuring a full set of eigenvalues, okay, um, albeit subject to experimental error. But that's the attempt. That's what we're trying to do. On the other hand, where the weak measurement, this is a two-stage process, as far as I can understand. Uh, one is weak, one is strong, is obviously where the name comes from. They each act on uh, 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 non-commuting variables, and it means that we do not observe a full set of eigenvalues. That's not the purpose. We're actually trying to measure a weak value, and that's my understanding of it, and that's how I've attacked this problem. Why atomic particles? Well, first of all, the whole theory is based on non-relativistic quantum mechanics, using Schrodinger's equation. Uh, most of the work um, uh, has been used with photons. Um, obviously, Ephraim's work, for example, is, uh, and they are Maxwell's equations. Um, secondly, we have had, um, uh, Yuji has done a, a really good job with the, measuring this with neutrons. And so, for me, I think it's that uh, we, all should, we all should see consistency through nature. Then we should be able to do it with atoms as well in the atomic system. And that's the task um, that uh, we've set ourselves. So the, me the method we're going to use, you've seen this diagram before. It's the one in this paper by Duck. Um, it's, uh, the, the, the atoms come in from the side here, okay? And they come along this axis. They're actually spin-orientated at some angle theta. And they come down here. They go through this weak stage. As I said, there was two stages to this. So there's a, this weak stage. And then there's this strong stage, so the, the, there are two magnetic fields set at right angles, and one is, specific, is much, obviously much stronger than the other. And then um, they, are, they are set at right angles, so they are non-commuting, which is one of the, uh, my understanding is that that is one of the criteria. And, um, and the weak value for this has been calculated, it's given in this paper, and it's basically the weak value is this, is mu tan uh, theta over two, and uh, the fact that it's a tangent obviously then allows it to, where you get this, is because the as theta gets small, then obviously the tangent uh, value blows up, and that's where you get this kind of uh, this, this uh, uh, amplification factor. And mu is just the proportion to the magnetic moment of the particle and plus other small constants. So, and I've just said this, though, what happens as theta approaches pi, then theta, then delta W gets really large. Uh, from an experimental point of view, we need a minimum of three magnets here. We need to set, set this spin. We need this one and this one. We also actually have uh, an overall magnetic field because um, 4G or un-4G, depending on your, your, your viewpoint, we live in a, a magnetic field, and so we need to nullify that. I won't show that on here, but that's, a, that's a, something which we, we have to do in atomic physics a lot is actually to nullify the effects of the um, Earth's field. So we are going to do that, even though I won't really show anything about that on here. Uh, the, the next thing I just want to tell you is, what is meant by weak? In fact, I asked this of the conference uh, two years ago, when I first considered doing this. What did we actually mean by this? And uh, after much discussion, 
I um, come to this conclusion that the initial wave packet is a superposition of possible eigenstates. It's uh, fairly standard stuff. And the action of the weak stage is it cannot be so strong that it actually I, does a strong measurement that it separates this out. It's somehow got to act on the wave function but retain the integrity of the superposition. And I went to Ballantyne, and uh, Ballantyne made the point. He said that each particle in a, in a beam or in a wave packet, sorry, is emitted as a wave packet, and its width is equal to the width of the beam. And that's, uh, that's it's written there. So therefore, for me, the action of the weak stage um, basically cannot uh, produce a divergence in the beam greater than the original width of the beam. All right, and that's how I've defined the strength of the weak stage. And so, but what it will do though, it will have an effect in uh, changing the phase within the wave packet. Okay, so our interpretation, um, as Baz already intimated, we're gonna we've decided to use an excited state of helium. Um, it's this, uh, oh, sorry, went berserk. Do apologize. That's, oh God, I've gone really mad. Right, okay, sorry. Okay, so this, uh, this excited state, 23S1, uh, which um, is on this diagram. I've put this whole diagram up. I'll, I'll, I'll look at this bit in a moment, but just focus on this part here. You can only reach it by basically collisions. And it's, uh, as I say, it's an excited state. The, one of the electrons sits at uh, 20 EV. And the way it de-excites is obviously it collides. When it, once you've done everything you want with it, you collide it with your detector, and it, uh, the electron comes off, and the electron comes off with 20 EV, which means that you can then have a chance to, to uh, detect it. And we use, we're, using, uh, we're gonna use a, a multi-channel plate detector, um, and, uh, and, and hopefully get uh, pictures of each of these, at, of these electrons striking the, the, the detector. Now, the, one of the, the things about this is, first of all, okay, it can only reach by, by collision. It's actually doubly forbidden to decay electromagnetically. And so, for that reason, it has a very long lifetime. This has been measured, not by me, by other groups, at 8,000 seconds, which means you've got plenty of time to do your experiment before it might, actually, it might uh, it will decay. And, um, and also, its magnetic moment is actually two Bohr magnetons, which is quite useful. Um, and then, and, but also, has this tripl it's in this triplet state, and what we want to do is use the m equals plus one state. So, this is a layout. This is the design that Vincenzo have come up with. It looks a bit, uh, it's just like chambers, but I just wanted to show it in its entirety, because I think uh, theorists think that you kind of throw these things together. But in fact, these pumps, for example, you know, they're very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do is just focus on this bit at the moment. This is the source, all right? And then what I will do is briefly explain um, the, the layout of this. And, and so, you, so you'll end up at the end knowing basically how we're gonna do this experiment. Um, now, the source, we, the helium, it comes in, and we're going to have a pulsed valve, because so we're going to have this pulsing, and we want this to, we want to produce a supersonic beam, and this is from this paper here, and this is the sort of theory uh, drawing of what it should look like, and M stands for Mach number, so you can see that the, the atoms that we want are the ones down the middle, where M, sorry, I've covered up a bit there, is greater than one. These are the supersonic uh, atoms that we want. This is a skimmer, it's a metal object where you all the, 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 the vast majority of the gas is actually pumped away and you don't use it, but a small amount of it, the supersonic part, comes out and that's what produces your supersonic beam. And what we're also going to do is put uh, an electron, uh, sorry, uh, a filament and a, an anode uh, with a strong electric field across here, so the electrons will then be accelerated across this space, and then we'll collide with the atoms, and then you'll get the um, excited states. Now, our engineering version of this, we've built this now, and uh, the helium comes in here. The, this inside, this is a pulse valve, okay? And then this is the, oh, the filament and the anode, and there you see the skimmer. And so the beam 
will come out the back end there. Um, we've got this actually mounted. We've set up this test rig. It's mounted in here. Uh, here's the pumps at the top, uh, pressure valves. Now, we need actually to monitor this carefully because we actually need a pressure difference between these. And these are the pressures that we're, 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 we're trying to work at, or we are working at. The helium enters from this side, and that device, which I told you, just sits in this space here, and then they come out. We've also, uh, at the back end, which you can't see, there's a, an observation port, and also uh, we've eventually, we put a detector on the front end here, so we can actually, just as a test, to see, to make sure that we're, we're getting excited atoms coming out. And, um, and then from this observation port, oh, what happened there? I'll press the wrong way. Oh. So I forget that up there. I haven't done this correctly. OK, so this is the picture. It doesn't seem to have come out terribly well. But anyway, you can see the uh, pulse of gas there, This the, the blue color stuff. You can see the skimmer. This is the pulse of valve here. The bright light is just the filament for the, uh, for the uh, electrons, the electron production So for, across there. And uh, this is, we just put an MCP in at the front end, as I said, at the back end, I mean. And these are, this is just a typical pulse that we're getting out. So we, uh, we feel really pleased that we've actually, we feel that we've got, preliminarily, we've actually got uh, the source and we've proven this method. It's, it's, we've copied it from someone else, so it's not original to us. And, uh, but we've, we feel that we, we feel happy that we've got it going. So basically, we're going to have a pulse supersonic, uh, supersonic beam. It's going to have a velocity of about two kilometers per second. We want a narrow velocity distribution, which is why we want to pulse it, because we want to get a, a narrow distribution. And the initial beam width will be about two millimeters, um, but we want to try and bring that down. Um, pulse frequency will run around about 50 hertz. Pulse width, 200 microseconds. Um, we need a static pressure of about six bar at the front end. And then that original skimmer is uh, about a quarter of a millimeter. The orifice. So these are the parameters that we're working with. And, um, and therefore, now, what the next stage, and this is the stage we're moving on to now when we get back from this meeting, is that we need to actually um, set the, is actually start doing some preliminary experiments on the beam. Um, essentially, we want to do things like estimating the flux, um, getting some estimate of the density profile, by, and what we're going to do, and this is where I need this diagram, you see this transition here, well, if we get a laser and shine it on it and to excite it from this state upwards, and then we can observe, this can uh, decay back, and we can observe this, um, then that will give us a good indication that we're actually, that the atoms are in the correct state. And then, um, and then also we want to measure the momentum distribution or velocity distribution, and for that we need to do what is called a time of flight. And what we need to do is put on a longer tube, put the MCP at the top end of that, and then we can start um, getting... And the kind of distribution that we'll get, or we hope to get, is this. What you do is, because you saw that the plasma lights up, obviously, there's lots of photons. So that tells you when the pulse uh, starts. That gives you your prompt signal. And then what you then do is you look for a secondary signal. And, um, and that's when, you, uh, hope for, that's when you're uh, picking up uh, the, the excited atoms. And then you can work out by taking the mean value. You can, you know, you can get a... Uh, an estimation of your time of flight. And this, I don't think this is as narrow. We'd like to actually beat this. We'd like to try and get as much more narrow, this, this distribution. Okay, so moving back to, so that's where, that is basically where we're up to. We've, we've, we've done a lot of that work. We're going to finish it off and hopefully finish it off this year. And then what we want to do then is move on to the next stage, which is actually the, 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 the stage where all the action happens. And uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to put in what's called a hexapole magnet in here, which will actually, which I'll explain uh, why we want to do that. And that will then focus the beam onto another skimmer, which we'll put here. We'll put another skimmer, and then, we'll, then, then the resulting beam from that, that is when we'll have the weak stage and the strong stage. And then eventually, obviously, we'll have a, a, some sort of detection system over here. Here's the hexapole magnet. Uh, we've been onto a company who make these. Um, the whole purpose of this, oh, for some reason it's come out a bit odd. It doesn't matter. Purpose of this is to focus the M1, the plus one state, which is what we want, 
All right, what we want to do is defocus the minus one state so we, they get spread out and then they'll get whisked off by the pumps. And the M, equals, sorry, the M equals zero states will go through unaffected and won't really affect us at all. So we don't have to worry about those. Um, here's the hexapole magnet. This is a diagram produced by the company for us. This is their, um, their, their design. And uh, this uh, point from A to B here shows how the, magne the magnetic field becomes is uh, de decreasing from, the, from A to B. This, the, then we we'll move on to the weak stage. The weak stage, as I said, we want a really, we want a very controllable but weak uh, magnetic field. And what we're going to do is use a simple two-wire um, and uh, system, and the beam will run through here. So you get this inhomogeneous, sorry, inhomogeneous field running down here, and the beam will run in in, in this space here. And obviously, by measuring the current of this, um, we can actually control the value, the, the, this field very, very carefully. Um, this is the strong magnet. Uh, we're going to get this manufactured for us. It's, it, we don't need to be variable. It can be fixed, so long as it performs the task of producing the normal stone galak uh, type uh, uh, separation. Uh, there's the beam that will be coming through in here. And, uh, and then, uh, as you can see, these will be linked together. So here's the weak one, here's the strong and hopefully we will observe the weak value, which will can vary from zero to up to infinity. So what we want to do, well, obviously we, just, we want to observe it. That will be obviously a great thing. But then we want to explore the limits on the angle theta. We want to see how varying this will change the weak value, how it will change it experimentally. And also I'd like to explore this um, strength of the weak magnet and actually test Ballantyne in a sense and say, okay, if I start to draw it out, will I get to that point where the whole thing breaks down because the, two, uh, because the beam is now spread too far? Um, so that's the, that's the experiment. That's how we're going to do it. And we finally sh finish off. Sorry, let's finish off now. Just a detector. It's a straightforward MCP. Those of you, don't, uh, a lot of people use them, and um, they're fairly common today um, in industry as well as in laboratories. And it's just, uh, 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 it's really a photomultiplier tube, to be honest, only lots of little photomultiplier tubes and, uh, where the electrons bounce down. And then what you'd have is a phosphor screen which collects that energy, uh, converts it to light, and then on the end there you have a, a camera and you take pictures. Okay, all sounds very straightforward, doesn't it? Okay, finish it off then. So I've tried to explain how I differentiate weak and strong. I hope I, I've got that correct. I've also tried to explain how, um, how we're going to do it using excited helium atoms. I've said what we want to explore, and I think we've made good progress. Uh, Vincenzo's been working with me through this academic year, and, um, and I think in that year, bearing in mind that this conference two years ago, it was basically an idea in my head, and we hadn't got any further than that, and uh, now we've actually got real stuff in a lab working. Okay.